I know we're all hungry, so bear with me for the next 15 minutes. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Fuller, and I'm a major here at Bridgewater State University. During my studies of the past three years as a history major, I've taken a variety of courses that touched upon women and their role in history, particularly in the United States. Prior to taking these courses, I had little understanding or appreciation for the efforts of American women and how they helped to solidify the freedoms that I personally enjoy today. One freedom, in particular, my right to vote, is something I've recently begun to reflect upon in depth. On April 19, 2007, my 18th birthday, I drove 10 minutes to my local town hall and filled in a simple form, resulting in my registration as a voter. At the time, I thought little of the magnitude of this experience, as I'm sure most young women in this room did as well. But what I have come to understand through my coursework at BSU, in conjunction with my findings from this research project, which I'm about to share with you, is that American women fought valiantly for years and years, 72 years in fact, to secure my right to vote, and more broadly, my feeling that I have unlimited opportunity as a female in this country. Guided by my new interests in the American female experience, particularly the suffrage movement, which resulted in the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, I began my research. I started my search on a broad scale, exploring the history of the suffrage movement in Massachusetts. Little did I know, I was about to uncover a primary source no, no other historians had examined that would serve as an incredible window into the past, offering a detailed view of the fascinating local story of the heated campaign for suffrage. There I sat, eagerly waiting at the small desk in the Beverly Historical Society, white archive gloves at the ready for the research assistant, Ms. Terry McFadden, to return with what I believed would be the ultimate catalyst to my summer research. A few minutes passed, and there it was, the Beverly Beacon. A women's newspaper published in the town of Beverly, Mass. From the year 1913, this document was a one-issue newspaper published by the Women's Auxiliary to the YMCA. As its editors spelled out, the Beverly Beacon intended to give Beverly women their own printed, widely circulated voice where they could broadcast their views on all manners of local and national issues. It is a paper with a purpose, two purposes in fact. One is to throw light on our city, its past and present, its virtues and faults, and more particularly on the activities and the opinions of its women. The other purpose is to substitute for tiresome tag day an intelligent, business-like method of securing funding for the treasury of the auxiliary of the YMCA of Beverly. The beacon does not aspire to be a lighthouse. It will flash out once and disappear. The document, rich in articles and editorials for and by women, includes two which take up the issue of women's suffrage discussing both the pro and anti position. And so I began. It was this document that told me there was an important story here, and to my good fortune, original, unexamined documents to tell it with. As I began to delve deeper into the history of Beverly, I discovered a wealth of historical documents beyond the beacon, which pertain to the suffrage activities during 1913 to 1915. These documents displayed in the most captivating way the witty political banter of the local, state, and national suffrage debate. The women of Beverly, Mass, it appears through my personal examination of these documents, seriously contemplated the pros and cons of inserting themselves into politics via the ballot. Perhaps surprising to our contemporary expectations, it appears that there were an equal amount of women willing to do whatever they could to stop women from voting. Both pro and anti-suffrage women in the town of Beverly believed that women were extremely capable and that, in fact, they were central to ensuring national progress. The local debate became rather, would the granting of the ballot to women hurt or help the cause? By allowing the sources to tell me the story, I discovered that both the pro and anti-suffragists of Beverly used three key arguments to make their respective cases. First. They argued about the impact of the vote on women's economic role in the family and how this would affect her pre-established responsibilities within the home. There were many economic changes taking place in the home at the turn of the century that brought into question the role of women in the home. 
Instead of self-sustainable households, the Industrial Revolution had turned the home into a place of consumers. One woman writes, the flow of industry has passed and left idle the loom in the attic, the soap kettle in the shed. The middle class home now had an unprecedented amount of resources available to them. And now the home was full of more resources and less and less of family. Men were at offices and children were at school for longer periods of the time, a uh, period of time during the day. Women remained in control of the home, but now her domain had simply diminished. These resources did not reduce the role of women in the home, only changed it. It was this changed role that led some women to look to a more public role. A debate then arose concerning to what lengths this public role would extend beyond the boundaries of the home, and by what vehicle the female presence would travel, bringing to the forefront the issue of suffrage. An argument used by the anti-suffragists in Beverly Mass, as displayed by Ms. Caroline A. Mason in her article featured in the Beverly Beacon, was that if women were to involve themselves in politics and express their opinions in the form of the ballot, it would have catastrophic consequences for family life. The presence and activity of women in public life has a perfectly logical and inevitable relation to the decline of the birth rate and the breaking down of family. We will not give place to any suffrage partisan in our estimate, estimate of women's capacity, but she is not capable, has never shown herself, and never will show herself capable of sustaining a life the life of the family with all its profound and absorbing demands and the laborious technique of public life. The pro-suffragists of Beverly would beg to differ, of course, on the degree to which female involvement in public life would harm the family. In fact, as displayed in a poem found in the notebook of Mary Boyden, the secretary and treasurer of the Beverly Anti-Suffrage Association, who herself documented newspaper contributions made by both the Beverly Equal Franchise League as well as her own anti-association, women could stay true to all of her responsibilities at home while still having an active public life, culminating in the ultimate expression of opinion, the ballot. I read some lines, once on a time, and they were very good, about a slip of paper and a box of walnut wood, and about the hand of woman, a frail hand it is true, but it can rock the cradle and drop the ballot too. And though against that fragile hand, distrust and doubts are hurled, still the hand that rocks the cradle should help to rule the world. Both the suffragists and the antis of Beverly believed in the female responsibility to take care of the home and those within. However, it was the belief as to what degree other activities, particularly those of the political variety, should play a role in the female experience that differed greatly among the two groups. The second most common thematic argument running through the documents is whether the vote would enhance or undermine women's traditional and it was thought biological and God-given position as the moral authority in American society. Women, particularly women in the role as mothers, had up to this time period been viewed as highly pious individuals, pure in nature and in turn delicate and too frail for politics. A soul and body meant for prayer and household duties, not for cleaning up politics, as were the thoughts of the anti-suffragists of Beverly. Any place outside the female sphere, said the anti-suffragists, would pose a danger to these faithful individuals. Women did not shy away from this highly moral reputation, as can be seen by Beverly's own Women's Auxiliary to the YMCA, who published the Beverly Beacon. It has been our constant endeavor to create around our association that atmosphere in which the highest ideals of moral character and Christian manhood may be nurtured and through which spiritual power may be infused into every avenue of its life. Beverly women believed in the female responsibility to nurture Christian manhood, and that as women, it was up to them to do so. This responsibility could be upheld because of women's inherent ability to have the best understanding of the highest ideals of moral character. The Women's Auxiliary to the YMCA of Beverly is just one example of the female public activity that women and the wider public deemed an acceptable move into the public sphere, dictated by their believed superiority in the understanding of a higher moral order. However, the pro-suffragists of Beverly saw these moral, pious tendencies as all the more reason for women to get involved in politics 
and of a farther reaching public influence. The suffragists of Beverly believed that if both men and women claimed that women had such natural moral superiority, that they should use their pure ways to clean up the filth of politics. Let them into the polls, and they will improve the atmosphere just as they do within their own realms of influence. The final and third key disagreement between the pro and antis lay in their view of specific social and political consequences that would result from women taking up, taking up the vote. Anti-suffragists of Beverly Mass targeted the fear held by the general public that granting women the vote would lead to the downfall of all women. These ideas originated from previously held beliefs about the female character and how women were, as a gender, unfit for the public sphere. Anti-suffrage women argued that the vote would indeed undermine women's emotional and intellectual balance. As Mary Boyden, there she is, the secretary and treasurer to the Beverly Anti-Suffrage Association, wrote in a letter to Mr. Chase, a congressional minister of Beverly, and you're all going to love this. <laughs> I think the effort to expand personality in the direction of political activity would cramp women's more characteristic development and bring her poorer powers into play. Her weakness in logic, her distaste for matters large and abstract, outside of her concrete experience, and a tendency to let emotion, prejudice, and passion enter into discussion of matters of justice, moment upon which there must be difference of opinion. For the antis, women were indeed more emotional and far less capable of making objective political decisions. In contrast, pro-suffrage women had no doubt that women could vote with their heads and not with their hearts. Anna C.M. Tillinghast, a prominent progressive, reverend, and suffragist of the town of Beverly, argued that the women certainly had the intelligence and reasoning power to cast the ballot. The ballot is simply an expression of an, of an opinion. It was decided by those who had the welfare of society at heart that there were certain classes of individuals whose opinions, for one reason or another, were not worth counting. In most states, these classes are children, aliens, idiots, lunatics, criminals, and women. <laughs> there are good obvious reasons for making all these exceptions, except the last. But is there any logical reason why the opinion of women should be so disregarded? The pro-suffrage opinion is that time and time again, women have proved themselves level-headed and positively influential. To class her among such low-standing individuals is doing a disservice to not only all females, but to the country as a whole, leaving Americans starving for the good that could come out of the enfranchisement of women. My findings suggest that there were three major themes that brought the local suffrage debate to life. The national economic changes and how these affected female responsibilities within her home and with her family. Whether or not female moral superiority had a role to play in politics. And finally, the social and political consequences that could occur if women were allowed to become voters. All of these thematic arguments leap from the pages of the Beverly documents. While I have read lots of great histories of the suffrage movement, including some specifically about Massachusetts, the local story of Beverly is one that has yet to be explored. My research is greatly significant to the historical record, the history of the suffrage movement overall, and the history of Beverly Mass. My research helps to illuminate what was occurring on the front lines or on the ground of the suffrage debate all across the nation, and suggest that just as suffragists picketed in front of the White House, they also debated, organized, and campaigned in small towns like Beverly. This story also reveals the complexity of the anti-suffrage movement. Not just conservative, stodgy holdouts, they were actually strong champions of women's role as a local activist and reformer. They did, however, also hold deeply felt and reasoned concerns about the impact of the granting of the vote to women on the American family, society, and government. They were indeed right to worry. Much did change. The day after President Wilson signed the amendment, the Beverly Times reported, women have set up a new record here. 399 registered yesterday for the September primaries. Total on list, 1,629. Beverly women set up a new registration record when 399 qualified to vote at the September primary yesterday. 
This is one of the largest registrations of any city the size of Beverly in the state. In this story, and with further research, historians will have an ever greater understanding of the winding path and ultimate success of the 72-year-long campaign to secure the female right to vote.